Hey guys, uh, this morning I'm actually uh, also not playing 15 minute chess. I have a tournament game this afternoon, so I'm trying to take it easy on my chess. But I am going to show you an older game that I played. This is again kind of part of the series in which I rose from uh, 1500 to 1700. This was the first tournament that I played in. Um, I should have put that it was correct. Um, but the topic that I want to talk to you about, and I hear this a lot, is, geez, I always play worse against players that are lower rated than I am. It's like I should be beating them more easily because they're lower rated, but I always play worse. And there are a couple reasons for this, I think. I mean, it depends on your situation, but one of these is probably what's going on. When you're playing someone lower rated, you can make the mistake of A, assuming that they're lower rated than you because they're just bad, and you're simply going to steamroll them. And the problem with that is you start playing really forceful moves, you know, thinking, oh, I'm just going to start attacking these things, I'm going to put pressure on this position right away. Um, but what that actually does is it decreases his total number of candidate moves that he has to consider. I mean, when you play a forcing move, uh, like a, if you take a piece, you know, your opponent has to recapture, so that really limits the number of candidate moves that he has to analyze. So when you play really forcefully, it makes it really easy for your opponent to find the best move, simply because he has to consider less moves in total. Uh, another reason why you might play poorly against a weaker opponent is simply because you don't give it his moves enough credit. You say, oh, he's only, you know, like a 1300, all his moves are gonna suck. You have to understand it's still chess, you know? If he plays a move that is only okay, but you don't really understand its reason behind it, like some of the most insidious moves in chess are the ones that look innocent, but kind of do two things at once, and that other thing is really dangerous. If you don't give him credit for that, then you're gonna get beaten. Um, and then the final one, probably the the worst to diagnose or maybe to fix as well, uh, is to say, "Oh, I'm better than him. This game is just going to win itself." Uh, so those are just some examples. Um, what I'm going to offer you today is I'm I'm going to show you a game which I was black against a player who was rated 1300 even. Um, I'm not sure what his live rating was. It was the first day of a weekend tournament. Uh, I was in the three-day uh, event. For those that play tournament chess, uh, you'll know, obviously, that if you're in the three-day event and you lose the first game, you can rebuy and enjoy the two-day event and play six games and kind of nullify that first game, at least in terms of the tournament and uh, in terms of you winning prize money. Um, and now you do know if you don't play tournaments how that works. So there's kind of an importance in winning this first game just because you don't want to have to, you know, rebuy and pay more money, like an additional 60 bucks or whatever when the entry fee was 80. This is a pretty big tournament. Um, just so that you can have a decent performance. So it's important to play well this first game. And this guy is so cool, my opponent. I've played the white pieces, which is why I have him in the bottom of the board. Um, he's rated, or excuse me, he's rated 1300, but he's 93 years old. Um, so again, I was only rated 1488 at the time, but even at that moment in time, I knew that he was lower rated than me. Uh, and I apply uh, a strategy in which I try to play as solidly as possible. Not passively, and that's something that we need to note, is, you know, there's a big difference between solid and passive. Uh, but as solidly as possible, not necessarily forcing moves every move always making sure I understand my opponent's threats and just solid play because eventually I know that what gives him that 1300 rating is him making mistakes so I play solidly until he makes a mistake and then you know I and what I mean by that is you know why are you saying well, why don't you play solidly against all your opponents well what I mean is like I avoid risky complication at all costs basically you know there might be a point in which some risk in a game against a stronger player is a good thing. You know, in my last video, if you saw, um, I, don't, I don't know if, I mean, that rook takes h5 move, 
was a little risky. If you play king to g8, then the position becomes murky. But if he takes the rook, then it's, you know, mate and eight. So, I mean, against a player like this, maybe that's not something necessary that you want to do. You know, like sacrificing the exchange in the last game. And if you haven't seen that, I recommend that you go look at it. it. It looks like a long video, but it's only 20 minutes worth of game, and I've got it highlighted in the description where the game starts and ends. So anyway, why don't we jump right into this one, and I think this is a good way to highlight how you play against the weaker opponent. Um, he plays the English. I always try to, like, push it towards a Tarash or towards a Queen's Game of Decline, just because I understand those openings better. And it's... At this point, that he needs to do something about the center. He needs to um, go ahead and isolate my d-pawn or, or do something. Um, but instead he plays b3, which I it, it tries to make sense, I suppose, you know, in getting on this long diagonal. Uh, but now the best move for me is to go ahead and take the initiative in the center. Um, and he already on move 9 makes uh, an accuracy fringing a mistake. I will just say an accuracy. Taking back with the knight instead of the pawn. Uh, maybe his idea was, was he was thinking I'd take back with the knight and then he'd just recapture with the pawn. Um, but of course I simply just push my e pawn and uh, he takes on c6 which is an awful. Um, and then he, I think, I, th I would consider this inaccurate again. Um, he builds up my center. Now, the difference here is if we go back a couple moves, instead of playing this, you know, if he starts chipping away at my center, um, effectively, you know, now I've got an isolated pawn, he's got a little bit less space. But, you know, this can be blockaded, etc., um, in time. And it's not so. It's not so bad. It's, that's kind of typically what happens in the trash. Um, but this just gives me the center. But again, I can't sit here and think. And I didn't sit there and think because I knew that I was playing someone lower rated than me. Like, oh, in this position, I've got the center. I'm just better because if you look, he does have. Even though it's not very many, he does have uh, a queen side advantage in pawns. Uh, so. He could make. He's got a queenside pawn majority, so he could easily make a queenside passer in an endgame if I'm not careful. So he's got some uh, a little a little bit of compensation for this. So you know maybe I've equalized at this point, but I still have to be careful. The game's not won. Um, so of course he continues with his plan. I play this just to protect this pawn. Um, it's protected, you know, an unholy amount of times, but, you know, it is attacked twice. So, and I wanted to kind of give some of my pieces freedom, and I had the idea of pushing this pawn and unleashing this bishop, so that's, that's a decent move, I think. So he tries to unleash an attack on this unprotected pawn, and that makes sense. And when I played bishop to b7, I saw a concept like this, but the trick is, is I can just play a6. And the fact that my pawn is hanging isn't as is important as the fact that his knight is hanging. So... He just kind of goes back home. And now it's my move. And the only difference is my pawn's on a6. So he basically said pass. <laughs> um, so now I play rook to e8 with the idea of moving the bishop at some point and, and protecting this pawn. Note, I feel like I'm kind of playing the white pieces here just because although his pieces all have scope, uh, he still has a little bit of a lack of space just because his pawn's on e3. Um, the other important thing that I was noticing is the c file is going to be important. It's going to be difficult for me to break through on it because the bishop's on b2 kind of acting as the b2 pawn holding the knight in place on c3. But still the c file is going to be important. Um, and so he plays rook on a to c8. And again it's it's becoming one of those, or excuse me, rook on a to c1. It's becoming one of those positions where you'll slowly find that like because I don't make moves that are really forcing, my opponent can't really figure out what to do. And he ends up making more inaccuracies. So again, it's kind of the inverse of what I mentioned before. Instead of making forcing moves that are easy for him to calculate and see what's best, make not forcing moves so his total amount of candidate or her his or her total amount of candidate moves is greater, so that it's more difficult to find the best move when there are more overall options. Um, I also bring over to the C file. Um, 
and now he plays knight to b1. Uh, and his plan for the next little bit is going to be rerouting this knight back into an acceptable position. Note that it was actually okay here, attacking uh, the the d pawn, but um, the funny thing is, is it's like because he didn't have anything to do, he worsened his position just to better it. Like that was his plan. Like, I'm going to make my position weaker simply to make it how it was before. That's not the greatest plan. Um, but he does open the C file, and that does open the idea of exchanges. And I looked at it, and I was like, you know what? Like, I'm playing against someone who's weaker. He's got less space. Why go and do exchanges? Why not go ahead and put my, you know, uh, stick my bishop on C5? You know, even though the rook exchange looked like it was really obvious, stick my bishop on C5, which stops the exchanges. And, you know, maybe one day it's going to help me play d4 um, and push this central majority forward. He plays bishop to a3, and again, this is now he's like, okay, well, I'd like to reactivate this knight. Um, the problem is, I can take and then play queen to a5, and there's no way for him to defend the knight, so it's going home. So, the fact that his plan was to weaken his position and then improve it was inaccurate. And so now he's stuck with this kind of crappy knight, and it's hard for him to, to, I don't know, reconcile his bad plan. Um, he kind of got his hand caught in the bad plan cookie jar, if you will. Um, best for me now, actually, is just to go ahead and, will not take, but take this first, and then play queen takes, with the idea of swinging the rook over and occupying this, the uh, seventh rank. That's the best idea. It's the best plan. You know, the knight hops in, there's just a whole lot of pressure uh, on his position all of a sudden. Um, for whatever reason, I didn't play that. That just looks, like, obviously best. I played knight to e4 to try to crack down on these dark squares, just so that his knight couldn't come to, let's say, d2. You know, I, I wanted to kind of... The other thing is I wanted to try to get him to play f3, to weaken this e pawn some, that'd be nice. Or if it even to him to like quote unquote strike in the center and let me play d4 and, and get a passer. Uh, so he plays bishop to g4 hitting out of my rook. But notice he's not really playing moves that are that are part of a plan, like part of a cohesive plan. You know, and my plan right now is kind of just to take advantage of the fact that he had a crappy plan. That's kind of weird, but. He doesn't. He doesn't really have a plan. He's like, oh, I'm now I'm attacking your rook, and maybe like this will give me some play on the c file. Well, yeah, maybe. And you know, maybe he wanted me to play rook takes rook, queen takes rook, which is probably the best move anyway. Um, but I just kind of took my rook back behind my d pawn again, preparing to push it forward. You know, I'm working on getting my my uh, like again. His his main play are going to be these two pawns. And queen side passers aren't, or, or the queen side pawn majority isn't really that useful until like towards the end of the game, just because when there are a lot of pieces on the board, they can actually become a weakness if they advance too far. Um, but so I'm trying to want to keep pieces on the board. Meanwhile, these these central pawns could become dangerous in the right dynamic, regardless of how many pieces are on the board. Um, so. He now decides to, to, to protect this pawn. Um, and not only that, it's giving him the, the d2 square, which is which is also good, I suppose. But it becomes scary because it right now allows me to play d4. Like, it already automatically justifies me playing d4. Um, because even after capturing twice, you know, this guy's going to run with tempo now, which is really dangerous. And with the knight here... Uh, on e4 and the rook on d8. It's just it just seems really dangerous if he takes I could consider recapturing with The rook and maybe trying to figure out some tactic on the bishop. I didn't really calculate all of that uh, Or I probably did this is just an old game. I don't remember what my analysis was um, But he moves his queen off of the file um, And this isn't the greatest uh, he is offering a queen exchange, uh, but I kind of go to a square that I wanted to go to anyway, just so I can kind of jump across this rank to some point, um, and maybe create some attacking chances with this bishop who now is really glaring down on g2 after the knight moves. You know, the knight can come back here, and you know, we could have some tactics going on. Um, and I, I don't really know what this move is about. Um, again, this is kind of like he doesn't know what to do. 
Um, so he just kind of plays moves at a random. It, it lets me, even though the computer, I don't think it really likes this line, it lets me create a protected passer because I have knight to f6 with tempo, right? And so now he's got a good bishop to h3 or bishop to, well, I guess that's really all he's got. Um, he could have, like, come home. That might have been the better idea. Uh, just to make sure that this, there are enough pieces stopping this pawn from just storming down into the end zone here, uh, into the, onto D1. But now I just secure my pass pawn, and it does make this bishop look a little bit worse. But I've got a cool way of, you know, so it's like, I don't like this bishop, this bishop stopping me from getting out of the C file. You know, neurons, they're connecting and firing, you know, we'll see something about that in a little bit. Uh, but now he's like, oh wait, I have this square, which is nice. But notice rooks are like completely disconnected, so he can't do it right away just because... Well, he can actually, but I, I prevent him from doing so. I play bishop to c8, and now he doesn't really have a choice because of the awkward position of his bishop. And the computer gave some crazy line with like g5 and stuff like that, and then playing bishop to c8. I, I mean, that's all like fine and good, I guess, but... I prefer to just go ahead and play bishop to c8. So I'm threatening to just crack open his king side. So he's kind of forced to put my rook on a nice file, right? So I'm like getting rid of like one of my worst pieces, I think, and allowing my rook to come to this file. Um, so the knight too, you know, maybe eventually could hop into to squares like this and you know bat for him in like that. And I don't know. That's it's hard to say. It would need to be dynamically justified. But now I've got the C file, which is nice. Um, and he is like, sweet, I've got this C4 square because he's advanced his central pawn. Before, when he played queen to a5, I didn't have this because he had a pawn on d5. But the problem is, is, of course, this is a very simple tactic. And again, I've been playing solidly. I wasn't trying to force anything. I let my opponent give me my central center. I get. I let my opponent give me my connected central pass pawns, and now I let my opponent hand me his rook, and this is where he resigns. Um, I didn't ask you to pause your videos. I'm pretty sure everyone saw this right away. That this was just hanging. Um, he took it with some gusto, um, but at least he had the decency to resign here. So again, I think that the point to drive home is. Play solidly, don't play to, to destroy someone right away. You know, don't play to beat someone in five minutes just because they're, I don't know, they're uh, 100 or 200 points weaker than you. The best way to win is to just play as solidly as possible. Take your time, you know, same algorithm, look at all the checks, captures, etc., all the threats that he could have. Don't play hope chess, as Heisman would say. Um, and you should end up winning. I mean, they're rated the way they are for a reason. I mean, the only caveat to that is if they're a kid, which is why I hate playing kids in tournament chess. And, like, that's all you get. Once I'm, I'm 22 years old, and you don't get very many 22-year-olds. It's always, like, someone who's either in their, like, young teens or below, or they're an adult, like, 30 years of age or older. So there's no one really in my, like, specific cohort, you know, of, like, just graduated college type kids and of all those people I love playing the adults because the kids they improve so fast you can never really truly tell what their rating is so that's I guess my final piece of advice is if you sit across the table and tournament chess from a kid I mean treat him as if he's 200 points stronger than what he says it is like if you're an 1800 and the kids at 1200 like don't be sweating bullets but if you're let's say a 1500 and the kid is a 1300 take the game seriously it might be a difficult game just because like I said they improve so quickly and a lot of that has to do with neuroscience and the number of neurons that they have available um, is much larger like the brain has a lot more plasticity than adult brains but that's getting kind of outside of the topic of this video anyway I hope you guys enjoyed the game um, there wasn't really like a favorite move of mine in the game I mean pretty straightforward he gave me the center you know I just slowly kind of protected the center made sure that knight looks terrible he goofed up again gave me the central fast pawns and even in this position um, I think that I, I've got a pretty heavy advantage probably like the computer would probably keep me like a one or two uh, pawn advantage 
Uh, yeah, I mean, the past pawn, it's protected, the C file, the knight coming into strong squares, uh, the weak squares on the queen side, I mean, it's just, it's a little much. So it'd be hard for him to hold on in this position. You know, I'm kind of glad that he played this move just because it made that first Friday night easy. I got to drive home a little bit early. Oddly enough, I beat this guy in 29 moves too. I don't know what it is with, with 29 moves with me. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed the game. Um, if you watch this, you know, leave a comment saying anything, you know, say that you liked it, you disliked it, throw in some analysis. I always prefer that you put in your own analysis as opposed to computer analysis. But if you want to throw in some computer analysis, that's cool. Um, just say it's computer analysis, don't say it's your own analysis. But uh, yeah, if anybody's watching, you know, let me know. Tell me what you think. Tell me what you like. I'm posting this, uh, you know, the chess.com blog, and I'll be posting this to my uh, YouTube channel. So again, guys, uh, thanks for watching. If you're watching, and have a good day.